morning, folks. This is the uh, Thursday, August 20th meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. We're meeting this morning in conjunction with the House Human Services Committee. Welcome, Human Services folk. We're really delighted to be able to do our budget presentation with you. Um, the first agenda on our, the first item on our agenda is hearing from the Department of Children and Families. Commissioner, thank you very much for joining us and your team. Rather than my trying to recognize your folks, it would be lovely if you would introduce them when we, um, when, when, when I turn it over to you. Um, I think, and I don't have an agenda in front of me because I'm resisting printing paper. I think we have about an hour for this. Am I right, folks, for the um, hearing from DCF? Yeah, I see a couple nods. So um, we may want to kind of strategically hold our questions. Uh, as Kitty would say, write them down. She does that right before she asks a question. Um, so. Let's try to strategically write down questions and we'll, we'll find some natural breaking points. I think that's kind of housekeeping. Um, Representative Pugh, thank you for joining us. Would you like to add, please? Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Representative Hooper. Um, no, just on behalf of uh, House Human Services, I think this is going to make um, the budget discussions um, and decisions uh, easy, well, um, more coordinated between the policy committee and uh, the money committees. And uh, we will be uh, taking, we will not be hearing a full budget presentation next week when the legislature um, reconvenes, but we will as um, necessary uh, get more information about the impact on um, Vermonters and on policy decisions. Terrific, thank you. Good morning, Kitty. We have we've started a couple of minutes ago. We've just done introductions, and I was just getting ready to turn it over to the commissioner. Excellent. Yeah. And, and we have the Committee of Jurisdiction with us. I see Representative Pugh and her committee members. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And welcome, Sean. Um, welcome aboard. I don't think you have testified since you have taken uh, the, the the helm of of the department. So um, we're excited to hear from you and congratulations. And it's nice to have you here with us this morning. Thank you. So um, uh, with me today, I have Sarah Truckle, um, our chief financial officer for the department, also um, uh, sitting in as Sarah Clark, the Agency of Human Services uh, chief financial officer. And then also uh, Candace Elmquist is here from finance and management. Um, unfortunately, um, just due to scheduling and other commitments, um, some of uh, the other deputies weren't able to join in today. Um, but uh, so if there's any questions that uh, Sarah uh, Truckle and myself cannot answer that we'll get back to you um, with the information as quickly as we can. Um, we did submit um, a uh, PowerPoint that we'll, that we'll walk through with the committee this morning and, um, and we're happy to take questions along the way as they pop up if that's um, or we can wait until the end, but um, um, our PowerPoint will kind of highlight those key initiatives we're working on right now and how they impact the ups and downs in, in our budget. Um, and then also we can uh, work through more line by line specific on the actual budget document as well if, if, if after the PowerPoint, if that's what the committee would like to do as well. Sounds good, thank you, Sean. Okay. So we'll ask questions at natural breaking points. Um, and uh, I think uh, the healthcare committee has, I'm sorry, the human services committee has joined us before. So we'll, we, you will see where there's natural breaking points and ask questions at those sections and then at the end as well. So let's continue. Sure, so just on this, on this overview sheet, um, just to highlight that uh, DCF is a, a, a rather large department. We have over a thousand employees. Um, amongst our different divisions and offices between the uh, Child Development Division, the Family Services Division, the Economic Services D Division, Disability Determination, the Office of Economic Opportunity, and the Office of Child Support. Um, you'll see uh, the different funding sources in, in the uh, Governor's Recommend Budget here. 
um, just over $424 million for the department. I would point out that um, what is not included in that overall total would be uh, three squares Vermont benefits that are issued out directly from the US Treasury um, that we process and issue out uh, for those that receive EBT benefits. And that's approximately 70 to $75 million a year. So if you add that in, um, we have about a half a billion dollars flowing through the department um, to support Vermont's families and children. Um, next page. Um, let me kind of skip down through. Yeah, and so this just breaks out the different um, positions that we have and how they're um, um, throughout the department. Um, you can see FSD has uh, a little over 380 positions. Um, admin has 373. Uh, to remind the committee, the committee's um, uh, economic services is within the DCF admin appropriation, DEPT ID, and so ESD staff are within that 373, and I believe at last count that that was close to like 330 of those positions. Um, so those are FSD and ESD are by large, uh, staffing wise the largest. Um, um, and then you'll see, you know, OEO is probably our smallest with eight staff and then scattered in there with CDD and the Office of Child Support, um, you know, varying sizes. Um, just to highlight, um, some uh, major initiatives that, that we're working on across the department right now, and, and, and some of these will be touched on in, in the budget presentation as we walk on through it. But um, in ESD, we are still moving forward um, with, um, it now has a new name. Uh, we've been referring to it in prior budget testimonies and, and in uh, con public conversations, uh, ESAP, uh, uh, sim a simplified application uh, pro program for older Vermonters and disabled Vermonters in the SNAP program, the Three Squares Vermont program. Um, we had hoped to roll that out on July 1st. We are on track now to roll that out um, on October 1st. We just had to push back uh, by three months just due to uh, all the work we had to do in the SNAP program, issuing out um, emergency allotment benefits and the uh, pandemic EBT benefit. Um, so it just took some of our bandwidth away. Also, you'll see that we're proposing in our budget to move um, that what is now done uh, through some community partners and, and with oversight by CDD, the uh, eligibility determinations uh, for the CCFAP program. We're proposing um, as a, a streamlining and budget initiative um, to move that um, work over to economic services staff who process eligibility. Um, also, a lot of work uh, has been going on um, regarding um, residential care and trying to reduce the, le the, the levels of residential care, um, particularly out-of-state care for uh, youth in our care and custody. Um, also, a lot of work going on um, with uh, juvenile justice and uh, raise the age initiative that went into effect on July 1st. Um, and then also, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about our plans for Woodside and our decision to, to close it and move uh, forward with a private provider with an interim plan in the meantime. Um, also uh, CCFAP uh, uh, year two plan, which we're happy to go over in a little more detail as well. Um, uh, also our, our initiatives that we really want to streamline and, and coordinate transportation better um, across the, the department, um, but particularly with CDD, you'll see that in the budget. Um, and then also we are moving forward um, with the first phase of the, the BFIS uh, IT system. And so you will see some maintenance operation costs in our budget. Also, um, we'll talk about um, in OCS, one of our initiatives is um, you know, relying more on technology and electronic communications to deliver notices. Um, and so that we're be looking to reduce our reliance on uh, postage um, as a budget savings. Also, um, you know, with COVID and the impact on the economy, we're, we're seeing some pressures in the reach up caseload and the changes, we, and we've been making a lot of changes to support that caseload given many of the systems of support that we use to support families in terms of education and job supports 
really are just starting to open up that we've um, over the last several months during the pandemic, we really provided some relief to those families and, and on the program requirements. Um, also with OEO, you'll see we're still moving forward with the family supported housing um, expansion. And then also um, we are not looking to implement the community based initiative um, that we've been talking about in the original governor's rec where we were, there was a conversation that may be starting in April 1st. Um, given everything that that's happened with housing um, due to uh, COVID that we felt like th this is not the year to move forward with that initiative and we'll be having conversations with our community partners and then um, understanding what, what the current environment looks like with COVID in the coming weeks and months as we put together our 22 budget, um, whether it seems appropriate to move forward at that point. Um, but uh, there are, is a lot of work going on um, regarding housing. We continue to house a large number of families um, in motels, although that number has dropped. Um, and we have rolled out um, a lot of the, the, the funds, most of the funds for the, the rehousing plan that were supported and appropriated by the legislature. Thank you. Um, and we're just starting to see the, the, the value and the benefit of those dollars going out for case management services, rapid rehousing funds, and um, rental vouchers. And so I'm um, happy to talk about that more as we go through the presentation as well. Um, just in, as I mentioned before, just some of the COVID initiatives, the housing plan, um, uh, the, you know, we touched on the reach up caseload and, and how that's impacted it. Um, I do want to just indicate that um, we continue to issue out um, a, an emergency allotment benefit each month that we continue to be um, in a state of emergency and with the governor extending it through mid-September currently, we'll be able to um, get seek approval from uh, FNS Food Nutrition Service to issue out a benefit um, for September as well. Uh, for the households that benefit from this, it, it, it uh, increases what we send out each month by a little over $3 million. Um, happy to talk about that in a little more detail. I mean, this is a great benefit for Vermont, but it, it doesn't benefit the entire caseload and that's one of our concerns. Um, also, uh, you know, we've um, been working with the food bank to issue out the COVID relief funds. Those, those monies have now been dispersed um, to the Vermont food bank to really meet the need, which is uh, great across the state for hunger right now in response to COVID. And I would indicate that we continue to have a mass feeding plan as well for every in place and, and continue to operate for all the households and families um, in, mo in motels across the state right now. Um, uh, just also uh, FSD, just the, you know, it's, we've certainly had some experience with COVID in our, our residential care. Um, some of those systems shut down and are start, starting to reopen and allowing us to move kids to more appropriate treatment settings. However, you know, it's incredibly important that we be vigilant at, as we move place kids in residential care and foster homes to make sure um, that we're providing for the safety of the kids, but also for the, the caretakers as well. And so the uh, FSD has done a lot of work around that as well. Um, CDD, um, you know, we are in the midst of the application processes in place uh, for the 12 million for what we're calling the operational relief grants for um, child care providers, after school programs, summer programs, um, CIS providers for telehealth, and then also uh, the money um, included for the parent child centers. Um, we've been um, fielding and, and uh, answering uh, questions um, coming in from uh, programs looking to apply and have just questions how that's going to work. Um, and so uh, the application deadline for those funds closes next week, and then we'll be evaluating all of those requests. It is not first come, first serve. We'll be evaluating the level of need and then making a determination if there's not enough funds, how we can prorate them so that everyone um, benefits um, from those resources as well. And then as you know, um, um, we are seeking $12 million um, in additional COVID relief funds to provide um, uh, school age care for kids during online learning days as schools are opening up across the state. Um, schools uh, across the districts are doing it a little different. Some are gonna be in, in person more, some are not gonna be in person at all, and some are gonna be do a hybrid model where um, they'll do online learning and then be in the building some. 
and that's really going to uh, put a lot of pressure on parents and and where their school age kids can go if they're not able to provide that support due to their work schedule or other factors. Um, and so we uh, rolled out uh, an initiative uh, to really um, increase um, the the amount of childcare available uh, for school age kids to access. Uh, for online learning. And so I'm happy to talk about that more in detail as well. And then um, just with all the work going on in housing, it's incredibly important that we continue the work um, of expanding family supported housing um, and really moving forward on our rapid rehousing plan and then the micro business funds um, that you've allocated as well. And just so there's a lot of work going on across uh, all of our different di divisions and offices across um, uh, DCF, and I couldn't be more prouder of the team and how they've responded. Um, just getting the day-to-day -day work done, and then also all of these um, additional initiatives, um, you know, that just require our attention and across the board from IT to support units to our policy teams to our operational staff, our, our um, financial staff, uh, you know, leadership have all responded and stepped up, and I couldn't be more proud of, of all the work that's happening across. Um, uh, the department right now. Thank you, Sean. Let, that, that's a perfect overview of the enormous work that you're doing. I don't see any hands. I'm giving you a chance to get a take a breath before you dive deep. Um, yep. But this feels like a pause point. Um, but I'm not seeing a, 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 committees. If you can raise your hands virtually, I'm I'm trying to scan the box so that we can see that. I'm not seeing anybody. So commissioner, it's yours again. Sure. So look, look, um, I, I beg your pardon. I think I just, yeah, a couple of hands popped up. Okay. Um, uh, Representative Pugh. Uh, thank you. And um, Representative Hooper, if you want some of these to wait, <clears throat> that would be fine you know, as well. Um, uh, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you for this clear um, overview. Um, I am, I've got a, a couple of questions around the um, transfer of the CFAP um, eligibility to ESD. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, I, um, if I am correct, in the past, this is a function that has been done um, in the community by our community providers. And this, um, I guess my question is, in, um, has the state been in the past providing financial support to those community agencies to in fact do this function? Yes, the, yes, we contracted with uh, community partners um, to do a couple things regarding uh, CCFAP and child care. Uh, one is the uh, eligibility work, which we're proposing to move um, to e have ESD eligibility staff determine, but also an information and referral service as well, which we are not impacting in this proposal and, and will continue to work in contract with those community providers to, for that service. So um, these are our child, for lack of a better term, I know in Chittenden County, it's the Child Care Resource and Referral Center. Um, but across the state, um, uh, what is going to be the reduction in um, state dollars or state grants to these uh, community partners? And do you have a sense of how many staff across the state these agencies, these community partners have to do the function? And so who is going to do it in state government? Are you asking for more positions or is this going to be under other duties as assigned um, or, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we intend, we are not seeking new positions for economic services for eligibility staff um, to, to do this work. We believe that we have the staffing and the system capability 
um, to, to uh, bring this um, in-house um, within the department. Um, we are uh, work with many of those fam same families in our other in many of our other programs. So we have most of the information that we would need um, in a, along with the applications that the families submit to quickly process those applications as we would um, any of our other programs, whether it's three, uh, um, uh, three Squares Vermont, Lie Heap, or general assistance. And now we, or, uh, we also do the utility discount program uh, for some of the larger utilities in the state. Um, but then also we would be um, adding in childcare eligibility as well. Um, in terms of the numbers of reductions that this would lead to in terms of staffing positions for our partners, um, we can get that, that number for you. Uh, Commissioner, I think that um, knowing my committee, as you know, um, we're going to need some more clarity and information, <clears throat> more detail than we believe, um, because we want to make sure that this um, child care is the backbone um, of our recovery. And it, um, in order for uh, working parents to be able to uh, balance working and having their kids go to school when it's not five days a week in a building. Um, this is going to be really important. And so thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll reserve other questions later. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I see Tom, uh, Rep. McFawn and Rep. Woods hands up. Um, I'm curious if your questions are related to the general overview or the specifics of um, both the, the, what we were just discussing, which is a nice um, intro to your administration budget. It, it, Teresa, if you scroll up the one, I think they talk about the moving there. Um, so, Rep. McFawn, do you, is your question related to this, or do you want to? Is it to something else? It, it's uh, it's related directly to what has been said so okay. far. Please go. <clears throat> okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thanks for coming in. Um, I have three quick questions. Um, the school age hubs. How many uh, children will be in them, and how many staff? Um, we are um, planning to provide um, increased coverage, uh, I believe, for just over 10,000 kids. Um, about 7,000 of those or so would be in the hubs. About 3,000 of those would be in established daycares where we will allow them um, uh, uh, to, to provide for up to four kids, um, uh, school age kids for online learning, which would provide about 3,000 new slots, um, and then 7,000 through these hubs. Uh, we're contemplating um, at least 10 staff per hub, um, and we're proposing 73 hubs around the state. Um, it might not all be one large hub. It could be look different in different communities. There's going to be some flexibility here for communities, whether a business in one area wants to stand up a hub or a community partner or a municipality um, that we're, we're contemplating about one staff person per 10 school age kids to support them for online learning during that time frame. So, so that means it's gonna be about a, a hundred uh, kids in each one of these hubs? We contemplate that they could serve up to a hundred kids. We don't anticipate that they will ever reach that capacity in one given day given the variance in the school schedules and parent schedules, but that they could serve up to 100 different kids. And so when we say there'd be a maximum of 10 adults per kid, we don't expect to see that ratio on any given day, just given some schools are in session. Uh, you know, it look, looks different in each school district. And so for each hub, they might have kids that, that come on different days, but and serve 100 different kids throughout a week. Okay, thank you. My next question is the food program around the state. Um, can you uh, tell us um, how the food bank is rolling this out? Are there any new uh, initiatives or, or is it uh, 
as they were doing it before in an expanded uh, way? Or do they have anything new that they doing? Yeah, they are. And, and I'm more than happy to provide some additional information to the committees here regarding that in terms of the grant agreement and their proposal. I don't have that available right at my fingertips right now, but I'm more than happy uh, to provide okay. their proposal and, and their grant agreement to the committee so that you can see how um, they intend to disperse those funds across the state and, and support um, their partners um, okay. that they work with. All right, we'll look forward to that. My uh, last one is, uh, can, uh, can you just explain a little bit more about why uh, the, in it, the uh, emergency housing initiative um, has been delayed? Um, that, yeah, so that initiative was to move away from motels um, yeah. as the main source of uh, <laughs> service delivery for uh, homeless families and individuals and, and move to a community-based model where communities um, and, the, and the housing partners um, have flex greater flexibility in how to meet the need. Um, and you know, there was certainly some concern about um, the partner's uh, ability to be ready for um, this July 1st when we had initially proposed it. And then in the initial governor's recommend budget conversations with the committee, um, you know, there was conversations about moving it to April 1st. Uh, so that we would start it at least uh, in the last quarter of 21. And I think, um, you know, with uh, uh, COVID-19 and our, and our essentially opening up the emergency housing program, um, which is uh, traditionally a very restrictive program and who gets served and how long you get served for, um, in response to that, many of our shelters were um, served very uh, vulnerable individuals who are highly susceptible um, to uh, se severe health consequences if they um, caught COVID-19 and were just congregate settings in general, which we couldn't assure compliance with health guidance initially of, of, of social distancing and whatnot, that um, we felt that um, to keep homeless Vermonters safe, that we opened up the emergency housing program and anyone who was homeless um, and, and kind of got the, did away with the, if the shelter beds available because many of our shelters shut down or significantly reduced capacity, which we would have been relying on greatly in the emergency housing initiative. You know, we would have been expanding those options. And in response to COVID, those options aren't gonna be able to meet the need. And we recognize that um, given where we're at, it just isn't a, a feasible plan to move forward with a community-based model this year, given where we still are in COVID. And given the rehousing plan and what we're trying to do um, in terms of services, um, uh, uh, rental assistance and rapid rehousing funds, and then with the VHCB um, uh, initiatives to bring uh, new units online and the rental rehousing, um, our hope is, is that it will um, really reduce the number of homeless individuals in the state. Um, when we when we work through all of those funding sources and fully implement and move uh, families and individuals out of motels, and then we'll have a better idea of what that community-based system needs to look like and should look like. Um, and so there's just a lot of unknowns right now, and we think it's prudent to um, delay it and get a better understanding of where we're, where we're going to be at in terms of um, these initiatives that we've rolled out, these housing initiatives, but also um, where we will be as a state in a country in a world with COVID-19 and, and, and are we going to see a surge? Are, are we going to continue to be um, in a good spot in Vermont? And so there's a, a lot of unknown variables right now and we think it's prudent just to um, let these other systems that we've implemented uh, uh, work, um, come to fruition and see where we're at and then also assess where we are at with COVID and then determine when's an appropriate time to move forward. We are still um, committed to, to moving forward with that initiative, but recognizing the world has changed considerably since we initially proposed it. Okay, Commissioner, thank you very much. I just have, are you uh, attached to the at the hip to those new initiatives uh, where we put all that money out for all those new units coming online? Yes, we've had um, agency uh, staff, uh, Sarah Phillips um, and others working very closely with the partners who are making those proposals and providing some technical assistance, but then also 
um, working with VHCB and, and others evaluating those proposals um, as we move forward to make sure they're meeting what we're seeing as the need in, in the communities around the state. Okay. And so we've been very involved in all of that work and continue to be very involved. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rep. Wood. I mean, McFawn. Uh, next up, I have Rep. Wood, Landfair, and then Pew again. So, Rep. Wood. Um, thank you, Representative Hooper. I, I will wait for my question until he we get to Child Development Division, so we can move along. Thank you, um, Rep. Landfair. Thank you. So, this is um, Representative McFawn is definitely making me recall things on that delay of emergency housing initiative. This was just, just to make sure I'm on the right track. This was the idea of having the community partners take, take the calls and approve um, hotel vouchers that I believe the agency was ready to roll out, but community partners were still in a bit of a flux when we left where we left off in, in March. So, so if that's the case, then I was just wondering, is that, has there been more work now in developing with the community partners on how to roll this out or how this would work for them so that everybody's very comfortable with this? Um, I, well, so I would say um, the work that we're doing with our community partners have, has been strengthened incredibly. Um, in our response to COVID, we are working incredibly close with our housing partners and other partners across the state now in response to COVID. Many of them um, are working with us on the rehousing plan um, and receive the funding to provide the, the services um, that go along with the rapid rehousing funds and the vouchers and then also the units, it's that three legs of the stool. And so yeah. I would say the work that we're doing is, is strengthening where we wanna go and in many ways, what we're doing with the rehousing plan, VHCB, and the rental rehab is exactly what we were envisioning um, the, the community a base model would be. And so we are actually laying the groundwork for that, um, for that model to be successful with all of the work we're doing now. Because in a way, it's really what we were trying to get to. Yeah. But as always, re the resources and timing are, are always a, a delicate balance. And I think that reflected the conversation we were having before COVID hit in, in, in your committee. And I would say that, um, you know, our response to COVID has really moved us forward immensely in those, both of those areas where now we have um, a lot of funding dedicated to this. And then also, um, you know, our response to COVID and keeping homeless Vermonters um, really, just required us to strengthen those partnerships mm -hmm. and work mm -hmm. so much more collaboratively. And I would say um, we, we are, are working much closer um, with our partners and supporting them. And I think this, uh, you know, our delaying this just recognizes that a lot of that groundwork is happening now, but it's just happening in these plan, these rehousing plans and development plans. Um, just in response to COVID. And we hope that once we see the other side of that and where we understand where we're gonna be with COVID-19, that will be much better positioned to move forward at that point in time, because hopefully we've reduced homelessness uh, for individuals significantly and we've eliminated it for families. That's our goal with our rehousing plan. And so that the pressure on our community partners to build that community-based system of care, a lot of that work's been done through these uh, our COVID work. Great, great, thanks, it's great to hear, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I think we're ready to move to the next slide. And I think we've covered much of what's on the next slide. Yeah, yeah, just, um, uh, you know, in our in our, our restatement of the 21 budget uh, that we talked about earlier this year, um, you know, we've talked about delaying the emergency housing initiative, which contributes to our up, our ups of 4.4 million. Um, also, um, our, you know, having to delay our implementation of the uh, uh, simplified application process for uh, older Vermonters and disabled Vermonters from um, July 1st to 10-1, just as uh, an up in our budget. Um, this one is, is an up, but it's actually net neutral. Uh, we're moving uh, with our proposal to bring um, the eligibility in-house to uh, ESD. Um, we would move the three eligibility 
uh, CCFAP eligibility policy staff uh, that work on that program to, to become a part of the S ESD program teams. Um, again, that, that's part of that eligibility, CFAP eligibility move. Um, also, you'll see some money, large numbers of money moving regarding uh, our TANF program. And a lot of that is um, we have to indicate in our TANF five-year plan um, how we're spending um, TANF dollars. And, and that changes has changed over time. And so we're moving money in the budget. It's net neutral, but it, we're moving it to, to, to reflect where we're actually spending it now than where we said we were um, before. And so it's just kind of reflecting the changes of how we're spending the, that, those dollars. And Sarah Truckel, this is a very technical area of our budget and, and I would rely, uh, refer to Sarah Truckel to answer any questions there. And then also here, um, this is really a net neutral. Um, we have a, an MOU with the Department of Labor um, for employment services, not only for our reach up program, but to a greater extent for our, um, our uh, uh, program, uh, Three Squares Vermont, in terms of supporting Vermonters who are looking for work and need support um, through our, our increased um, employment and training program. Um, and we're just moving it out of reach up due to that it does serve a much broader purpose and population than reach up. We're moving it from the reach up depth ID to the admin ID to reflect that reality. Um, and then um, some downs in our budget here of a little 300,000 um, are one, those would be savings from bringing it in house and having our staff do that. We would uh, realize some savings and then um, uh, we're seeing some reductions from our HR partners and ADS. Um, and so we're seeing some internal service fund reductions where we have to uh, provide uh, resources to those that provide services to us internally. And that's just reflected there as well. Thank you, Commissioner. We have uh, one question from uh, Representative um, Rosenquist. Well, it's probably a little late now, but I was uh, looking at this slide. Uh, it would be useful if I understood what all those letters mean. I, I always have a problem following some of the abbreviations, if you will. So it'd be useful if you introduced it with explaining what they were. Sure. Um, ESAP is the Elderly Simplified Application Process. That's the acronym. Um, CDD is a Child Development Division. Um, ESD is the Economic Services Division within um, uh, TANF is a temporary aid to needy families. That's how the uh, program is referred um, to at the federal level in Vermont. We refer to it as the reach up program. Um, VDOL, uh, V-D-O-L, uh, that's Vermont Department of Labor. Uh, MOU is Memorandum of Understanding. And then the CFAP is the Child Care Financial uh, uh, Assistance Program. Uh, you know, the subsidies that we provide uh, families to afford child care. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Representative Pugh? Thank you. And um, Commissioner, if this is something better done next week or offline, it's fine. Um, the TANF five-year plan move, um, you talked about it being technical. Um, I'm aware that the federal TANF money uh, in the past has not necessarily gone <clears throat> to uh, financial um, the, 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 um, the monthly financial benefit, but rather to um, other worthy um, initiatives. Maybe it's the earned income tax credit or something like that, and maybe childcare. So I'm wondering if we're moving it more into TANF, what's happening to <clears throat> those initiatives that in fact had um, been supported by federal TANF funds. Yeah, and uh, what I can say is, is that we're still spending the money in many of the same ways. It's just it hadn't been reflected in the TANF five-year plan. And so we're moving it in the budget to reflect that. But you are correct that we, we spend um, our TANF dollars very creatively to the benefit of Vermont financially and um, our reach up program participants because it allows us to use our federal dollars, which um, have certain requirements and performance requirements um, attached to them 
And we, a lot of those dollars we do, um, just as we do it in, in the lie heap depth idea where we use some of our um, lie heap block grant for weatherization, then we free up special fund and have more flexibility to use that to serve different populations. We really do the same thing in the reach up program where we um, fund the earned income, the state earned income tax credit, um, which is an allowable use of TANF money. So for finance, uh, TANF eligible families, we use the TANF money to pay for that benefit. And then the tax dollars that are raised to fund that, the special fund is transferred to um, uh, DCF. And then we're allowed to use that special fund um, more flexibly than we are the TANF dollars. In one of those areas, um, you know, the federal government has a hard stop at 60 months and, and in certain circumstances, you can use TANF dollars to fund families beyond 60 months, but uh, for the most part, you cannot. Um, Vermont has a different 60 month time limit where you can continue to receive benefits past 60 months. Um, as long as you're engaged and continuing to cooperate, we would not be able to use federal money for many of those households but because of the way we leverage the TANF block grant, it frees up special fund, which allows us to better support families beyond 60 months and make sure kids are getting taken care of and families are getting the support they need as we move into financial independence. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Pugh, do you have a follow-up? <clears throat> Excuse me, yes. Um, internal service fund reductions, what are those? Um, that would be like uh, when the Department of Human Resources provides us services, like through an HR manager that works for us, or um, uh, the Agency of Digital Services, we now, um, all of our IT are, are consolidated in the Agency of Digital Services, and we essentially purchase IT services from them, and we do that through the Internal Service Fund, and their costs have gone down. And so then our cost to purchase those services go down and that is reflected in the downs in our internal service funds. Thank you. Thank you. Someone just came to mow the lawn and so I needed to close some windows and shut some doors. I apologize. Uh, life at home makes this a little difficult. Uh, I do see another hand that uh, uh, Representative Lamper. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, it does make working at home interesting as we we all get to, I don't know, experience all of our other lives live on TV. Um, I just I've got a question around like just just the mechanics of something, uh, Commissioner, and, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong because I just want to make sure that that I'm as I'm tagging this up that I've got this correct. So when I'm looking at DCF's budget that was presented back when on. Uh, January 30th, 2020, seems like a very long time ago. Looking at their ups and downs for, you know, just this section, the budget, the administration, mm -hmm. the ending point um, that, that that recommendation was, was at 57 million and, and some. And then when I'm looking at the ups and downs that were presented by um, Secretary Smith earlier this week, when I go to the corresponding section here for DCF, the starting point for that now is the ending point of where we were in January. And I think I'm probably confusing you more if you can't see it. So what I'm looking at on the new ups and downs that was presented earlier this week, those are just the changes uh, currently, but if we were to okay this, it's also okaying everything that was um, presented in January as well. So I need to combine those two things, see them side by side to say, this is where we're going. That's correct. Probably. Our starting point here was the governor's- Ending uh, point. Yeah, our starting point was the governor's recommend in 21. And this right. builds off that and reflects changes okay. from what we had proposed in there as well, like the delay of the emergency housing initiative would be something that was in, in the original 21 that we're now backing out because we're delaying it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll look at those two things side by side. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Diane, uh, thank you. You've brought up an excellent point. So as a follow-up, 
Is there anything in the January presentation that you are proposing that is not highlighted here that we need to go back and find? And or are all the are all the changes moving from 20 to 21 highlighted in your re in your restatement budget? Yeah, I'm going through through that quickly now. Um, Is there an initiative that we're missing or a change in funding or a reduction in funding mm -hmm. in your proposal that isn't being presented today because it was presented in January? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I'm happy I, I would, to. Yeah, I'm happy to kind of uh, kind of take those side by side and get and and uh, and um, yeah. provide that detailed information to the committee. Um, as we move forward, I think I would want a little time just to make, to, I think we touched yeah. on it here, but I just want to double check that we didn't miss something, so. Uh, Sarah, were you about, I, I heard another voice that sounded like uh, you, Sarah Clark, was that you or not? It was me, Sarah Truffle. Um, I, we can provide that, but I would say that there are pieces in the FY21 Gov Rec that we didn't highlight here um, that were in our original presentation. Right, right. Could you give an example of something that may? Um, so some of the reductions to the um, IDA program in OEO or the mic micro business reduction, um, the $200,000 reduction in the child development division for the um, stabilization grants would be examples that I could think of quickly. Mm -hmm. That's going to uh, be important for us to have the, the complete picture. And I know that is our work as well to go back and find all mm -hmm. of the information. But um, th th thank you for, for bringing those examples uh, to us. But if you could do um, a side by side so that we know the complete um, picture of the changes that are before us since we, since the budget really at hand now, even though it includes what was proposed in early in January, Mm -hmm. We need a refresher and we need it all in front of us. Yeah. Sarah Clark, Clark here. If, if I, I, excuse me? Sarah Clark here, if I may, just to clarify that this will be the same across all the departments of AHS. They'll have presentations prepared to walk you through changes um, in the restatement budget. So changes from the January Gov Rec. Um, but they also know to be prepared to discuss anything that was included in the FY21 original GovRec. Yeah, but yeah. Um, their kind of presentations are geared towards what's changed. Okay, but not just prepared to discuss it, Sarah. They need to highlight it so we can discuss it because January is a long time ago. A lot has changed. Um, we we did not realize that we were just going to get a restatement budget, you know, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know I, I didn't know what to assume from the administration, and I understand, um, you know, why they may, you know, why they chose to do it this way. But it, it, we can't work under the assumption that we remember, um, and it's up to us to go back and, and see it. But I'm asking that that they bring forth all, you know, the full picture, and and not count on us going back and searching because we are working on an incredibly short timeline. And um, to be able to go back and, and dig for all of those changes, you know, the highlights, um, all the restatement, but all the, all the changes based from, 20, from 2020, please. Sure, I will deliver that message. Um, and we may have some additional follow-up since, as you know, everybody's already scheduled to testify today and tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, I do, yeah. Well, we're happy to provide you a overview of those initial gov rec changes um, that are still um, uh, moving being proposed to move forward and then also how they might be changed by the restatement and then right. new changes in the restatement as well and we can get that to you pretty quickly and and sarah i do know that, that you're responsible for the agency of human services but i i realize that uh we've had several other um departments in, in the last couple of days. And I, I did not realize I should have been asking those questions. I knew it was built off, you know, it was brought to our, it was built off the, uh, the January proposal, but I need that it, it, across the board is the same presentation for ADS and BGS. 
are, are, do you know if, if they also, their initiatives that may not have been highlighted because they were brought forth in January? I don't know for certain, but I will follow up with Commissioner Gresham. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you, or, and, and I, I can as well, but thank you. Um, all right, I don't see another hand uh, at this point. So I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Iacovoni, and then we're on page six of 15 of the slides. And so um, I think that we're going to have several questions at the end. So after uh, Dave's question, I think we should uh, move through a few more of these slides. Uh, Representative Biacovoni. Uh, I'm sorry, and I'll be as quick as I can. There's three quick questions. The 296,000 general fund down, are there federal funds uh, associated with that also, Sean? Uh, excuse me, Dave, I had trouble hearing you. Could you re re uh, restate your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me know if you can hear me. The 296,000 general fund reduction. Are there also federal funds that are being reduced? Um, I'll defer to Sarah Clark, but my um, assumption would be yes. Okay. I'm Sarah Truckle. Sarah um, Truckle. And, and I, I'm happy to answer yep. that, Representative Iacovoni. So yes, we only highlighted our general fund reductions for the purpose of the presentation. Um, there are associated federal fund reductions. So for example, in our ISF um, reductions, you'll see the federal, uh, the general fund down, but there's also a corresponding down for our federal okay. ship, how that's yep. uh, yep. Yeah, that's what's important to look I at the crosswalk. I'm trying to... uh, thank you, uh, Diane. Um, uh, the reason I ask, I'm trying to appreciate the full order of magnitude of the reduction to the uh, community partners, many of them the uh, parent child centers, they, um, they have fixed expenses, um, building costs, et cetera, insurances and whatnot. So when we take programs away from them, their capacity to spread those costs out over the various programs that contribute to paying for them uh, disappears. And I'm concerned whether you've had the chance yet, I suspect you haven't, not a criticism, I shouldn't assume, to understand from that provider community um, whether they're going to be destabilized as a result of it. So that's just a footnote if you could have that conversation and share with us and let us know. I'm gonna to shift to another area, somewhat related. The reduction, uh, excuse me, the increase in caseload pressures and reach up. Um, I'm curious the order of magnitude and whether they are um, increasing the, or actually reducing the staffing ratio of uh, uh, reach up staff to clients, whether they're having to serve more clients. And specifically, my recollection is, and it could be wrong, we a policy change was made to move away uh, the um, reach up services done by our parent child centers and to bring them in house. My concern is that if the caseload is increased and the staffing ratios are, are reduced, that the capacity to serve the high needs uh, families with young children that wasn't our parent child centers will be diminished. So uh, that's, uh, could you speak to um, the amount of the case of pressures and the staffing ratios. And finally, and then I'll stop, I promise, Madam Chair, um, the uh, MOU change with VDAL from Reach Up. Do you have a concern, Commissioner, that um, those staff will, will be forced to help people with unemployment claims, which is important, uh, but they'll be pulled to prioritize on that and won't be able to do the Reach Up uh, job finding? Thank you. Um, in terms of the reach up caseload, um, I, we can get you exact numbers of, of our uh, worker uh, our reach up uh, case manager to ca uh, number of cases each is carrying right now. What I can say is that given um, many of the changes that we've implemented um, in response to COVID, that um, they've offset any increases in, in caseload pressure given that we've um, kind of put waivers in place in terms of um, uh, work participation, um, given some of the systems of care shutdown, 
um, so that so some of that work um, is not taking place. And so some of that case management work is not as intense right now. Um, and then also given um, that meant, uh, we were doing a lot of home visiting before and, and appointments in the office, which took more time for travel and whatnot, um, everything now is virtual or over the phone. And so we've found great efficiencies in that work. And, and to the point where even though we've had upward caseload pressure, um, we've had the capacity to, uh, for homeless families that um, are gonna be served by the agency's rehousing plan, uh, that we've taken that work in house and are having our reach up case managers um, provide those services right now because they have the bandwidth to, to do that work. And I would say in terms of the Parent Child Center, we did implement that change. Um, uh, uh, from our perspective, um, we're not seeing any adverse consequences from that and delays in services or or the quality of the work that we provide. And many of those families who, who might have been working with the Parent Child Center in multiple roles through their other programs, but also received uh, reach up case management, um, most of them are still connected with the Parent Child Centers and receiving those other services and supports from them. Uh, the only change would be that they're now um, receiving reach up case management um, with our staff who work in collaboration with the Parent Child Center staff and other community partners that those families are involved with. But we can certainly get you um, the reach up uh, caseload increase, the projected increase based on the budget and what um, our Leslie Black Plumo is projecting based on um, the report we get quarterly and the state of the economy in response to COVID and, and then provide you that, that uh, cases to worker ratio as well right now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm looking for uh, another hand. I'm not seeing any. I see. Um, I don't see any other hand at this point. So let's continue to the next slide. Teresa, can we continue to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, as you'll see in, in, the, um, in the Family Services Division, um, there had been some new positions proposed um, uh, given that we were looking to replace Woodside and close it and come up with an, a new alternate plan. Um, a Woodside is still operational at this point, so those uh, positions aren't needed. And so those are reverting back um, in, in the budget. Um, and then I would, um, have Sarah Truckle explain the TANF five-year plan and it's in, and how it's connected to the re, to the Family Services Division. Sarah Truckle, if you'd want to just yep. Touch so on this that. is the this is the technical adjustment that you saw above in the admin where we're moving money between the admin debt ID and the FSD debt ID in order to just properly reflect how DCF has been earning its TANF funds. Um, it's net neutral. It doesn't have any effect on our program. It's a technical adjustment to make sure that um, it's an accurate reflection of where we're earning those funds. Um, and again, we have an internal service fund reduction in the restatement, as we talked about, just in terms of how those costs are allocated um, amongst our different divisions. So they're spread out those uh, internal service fund reductions are spread out based on their usage and prorated to each division or office within DCF. Um, again, because Woodside is open, we had allocated some additional funding in the original GovRex to, for, for placements. Um, you will see that the Woodside budget um, is in here. Um, and we are proposing some reductions just based on the number of kids that we're serving there right now as we look to replace it. Um, and then also you will see, um, just as you would in, in, uh, in many of the agencies, uh, different departments budgets, um, the FMAP increase um, um, also affects 4E. And so we're seeing additional federal revenue um, in here, which allows us to offset some general fund spending as well. Um, and then again, um, because Woodside um, was not closed, on July 1st, um, we're reverting back some of the replacement um, 
on family uh, group counseling that had been uh, proposed to be spent, but given where we are right now uh, with Woodside, uh, that's not needed at this time. Um, Representative Fagan has a question. Sean, thanks for coming in. Regarding Woodside, as of the report that was submitted on Tuesday, uh, it said that there was one child that remained at the facility and you were working for a uh, private placement for that child. What's the status, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah we, um, we are still working uh, very hard with a provider uh, to develop a, uh, an appropriate treatment uh, program for that youth. And once um, uh, we believe that, that that's in place, um, we will then need court uh, authority to move that youth given it will be, it is going to be an out-of-state placement where his, uh, that youth's treatment needs can best be met. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Representative Redman. Just to follow up on that line of um, questioning on Woodside, I'm curious, you mentioned the, the staff changes. Can you just give us a general sense? And I'm sorry if you covered this earlier because I got here late um, coming from another meeting, but can you give us a sense of what's changing on the staff level relative to Woodside and the staffing there? Yeah, so it, it is a complicated um, conversation. There's many factors that are leading to, to the staffing levels at, at Woodside and what we're proposing. Um, the conversation that started a year ago to, to close Woodside um, has had an impact on the staffing in general. And so many staff realizing that the census has been down for quite a while, sometimes you know three youth, sometimes one, sometimes zero, currently one, and then the, the conversation um, to um, close the facility, many staff started looking um, for other work. And, and just recently, we've had two more staff give their notice that they found um, other, other work that, um, and, they've, and they've given their notice. And so we have a large number of vacant positions in general right now. Um, at Woodside as a result of kind of just staff attrition and then not fill, needing to fill those positions given, you know, the low number of youth that we're serving there. Um, that's a staffing pattern of, of the number of staff that have been there based on historical numbers of kids that could approach 30 at times. And so, um, you know, we have a large number of vacant positions right now. And so as we evaluate what we need, um, you know, we don't uh, feel like 51 positions is, is appropriate. And so we believe that um, we can um, eliminate uh, 20 positions with the, current, the way the current uh, operations are at Woodside and not impact operations or the services for the youth, given we only have one youth there. And so uh, many of those are vacant, but there may be some rifts um, as we're putting this budget together. Um, there was contemplated to be some rifts, and we can get you a more exact number on that. But given we've had some more um, people, uh, staff leave the facility, that may no longer be the case. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Redmond. Um, we have uh, we've only been through half the slides, and we only have a half hour left scheduled. And so um, I think we need to uh, move further. My question on here would be, but uh, Sarah and others will help get this information. What other changes were made in January that are not reflected in this division and in all others that are, that are not highlighted? Uh, that's going to be key in our decision-making. So sure. I think we need to move to the, the next slide, Commissioner. Sure. Um, um, uh, in, in a child development division, um, we had contemplated um, some transportation savings in the original uh, governor's rec, is my understanding. Um, and I apologize, I tried to get up to speed as quickly as possible in the other divisions, but uh, original governor uh, recommends budget. And um, as I'm not familiar, I'm very familiar with ESD's original governor's rec, but and I um, just was working to get up to speed on the original as well. Um, uh, uh, that did um, trans, uh, transportation work uh, in terms of trying to do a global transportation contract, um, including all transportation needs across DCF um, due to COVID didn't happen. And so 
um, you know, we're going to see, you'll see the up back in the budget to, uh, that we would need, the general fund we would need to continue to provide transportation uh, for, for, for specialized child care kids. Um, also downs, you would, um, we are with the change of um, bringing um, in-house the eligibility work and moving it to, to ESD. Um, CDD has two grant monitor positions who go out and monitor and audit our community partners work in this area. And given um, we have those systems in place already in-house in ESD to monitor and audit and oversee our eligibility functions, those positions um, won't be needed. Um, they are currently filled positions um, and they would be eliminated. Um, I am very confident that um, we have many other vacant positions um, in the, uh, the department right now. And I'm very confident that we will find other positions that suit those two staff's uh, skills and abilities and interest. Um, we're working with them now um, and we have um, some time to do that work and we have uh, the vacant positions to give them some opportunity and choice as well, which, you know, which position might meet their interest and skill set and education as well. Um, as we talked about earlier, we would be moving the three policy positions to ESD. Um, that's really net neutral. Um, we are proposing um, some contract uh, reductions here. Um, we believe that we can do that without impacting our partners. Um, we have some unspent money every year in our uh, grants and contracts. And so we're confident that by evaluating those and, and, and um, reviewing those that we can uh, find some reductions without impacting any of our providers that we contract with in terms of uh, what, they're, what they are drawing down and what they utilize from those contracts. Um, again, uh, just the internal service funds, um, the 4E FMAP increase is freeing up general fund as well. Um, uh, subsidy revenue shift, I will have Sarah Truckle um, uh, touch on that briefly. So with the move for the CCFAP program to ESD, the way that the funds would impact our cost allocation allows the CCDF that we're currently utilizing in that eligibility and referral uh, community contracts to move uh, to be freed up. And it allows us to make a revenue shift to free up general fund because we can put more CCDF into the subsidy budget. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Um, and then, you know, we've touched on the moving the, the eligibility um, over there. And then also, uh, the, the, you know, we do utilize um, TANF um, in, in the CDD budget. And, and this is, again, based on that conversation we've had regarding, um, the, you know, it's a technical uh, net neutral um, to DCF, but just how it's reflected in our budget is really the change. Uh, we have one question from Representative Wood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, I'm just, uh, I had held off this question from before, but could you uh, briefly explain what, what problem or what issue you're trying to solve by um, changing the eligibility and referral system that you currently have? So what's the problem that you're trying to solve by, by changing that? I wouldn't say that we're trying to solve a problem. I think we were facing an incredibly difficult uh, budget development um, with, uh, in response to COVID for uh, the 21 and then also looking forward to 22 and um, looking at creative ways to streamline processes and to do uh, leverage existing resources um, to save money. Um, and given that we um, do have a very extensive eligibility system within the department, with our economic services staff who um, are very quite skilled and we have a large number of them that by bringing this in-house we could realize some efficiencies uh, provide a, 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 we think as good of or better service and then also um, save money as well so it's one of those um, initiatives that really enhances services and our ability to provide services but also saves money thank you um, just one follow-up. I'm just, um, 
in, in my experience, uh, when programs are split between, when operations of programs are split between two divisions in state government, it, it doesn't actually end up being more efficient. And uh, that's just been my experience. And I'm just uh, wondering if you have any concerns about that. Uh, I do not. We have a very strong collaborative working relationship um, between the Economic Services Division and um, the, C the Child Development Division um, with um, our uh, Reach Up program. Um, child care is, is, is a big component of that. And so we're very, uh, have those established working relationships with CDD and their policy team, their data team, um, their systems teams, um, so that, and the sharing of information. So I'm very confident that um, we can uh, implement this and implement it well and fairly quickly. And then the, just the final question, in, in the overview, you mentioned um, the BFIS system, and I don't see, I don't see any mention of that here uh, and moving forward with some of the, the changes that are necessary there. Yes, we. Um, you will see, I think, um, Sarah, if you want to jump in here, Sarah Truckle, on, on the BFIS system and those costs. Sure. So the BFIS system is moving forward. We just have um, moved forward on a signed ITABC form pursuant to our internal processes. And that $250,000 of MNO was in the original FY21 GovRec. We included it in the general initiatives because it's a major initiative going on within the department and CDD at this time. So there isn't anything beyond what we had provided originally in the 21 budget. I mean, in the 20 budget. We are currently moving forward with a phased in approach to the BFIS system, which will utilize the, I believe 900,000 of remaining funds from the initial legislative appropriation, as well as increased CCDF dollars that happened in the federal budget in October of last year. Um, and we're, instead of building a system at 6.7 million initially, we're gonna take a phased in approach and build it module by module, focusing first on the initial flip necessary to um, meet compliance requirements with the CCFAP subsidy um, system. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry, we did have a couple. I have two questions. I have Representative Iacovoni and Lamfer. Yes, that, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I'm less concerned about the administrative efficiencies and the interplay between ESD and, and CDD. I'm more concerned about the potential inefficiencies for consumers who today use services that are not, not exclusively, but often integrated. So that when a mom or a dad talks to a, an eligibility worker at their parent child center, at the same time, they can begin to talk about uh, appropriate child care placements within their community. By removing the eligibility from the local level and moving it to the state, which may be more administratively efficient, um, is it, is it, are the benefits really accruing to the consumer? So I just, uh, I raise, I appreciate Representative uh, Wood's concern. My, my, um, concerned about efficiencies are defined a little differently. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, and Representative Lanfer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I'm looking at uh, some of the movement here on your crosswalk, I'm sorry. Um, in your original January presentation, you had $2 million, $2 million coming from the education fund going to the early care and learning initiative. And in your new revised budget here, you have removed the $2 million from that special fund, which I'm assuming was still the education fund and are now taking it or recommending that it come from the tobacco fund. That's correct. So the original proposal had 2 million coming from the um, proposal around Keno. And yes. now we are proposing that it comes from the tobacco fund. Okay. So, so then the TANF here, I see that there's, is it 
Is that 15,000, 15, 15, um, 15 million, 15 million from the general fund and now being paid for out of a special fund. And I don't know what that one what is now. What what special fund is that that 15 million coming from? So that's another TANF five-year move plan. It's technical. Um, what we're proposing here is leveraging TANF funds and CDD and putting general funds into the reach up debt ID. Um, this in particular uh, will, will allow for some flexibility in that reach up debt ID so that as caseload shifts over time, we can achieve general fund savings or we can um, adjust it accordingly. Um, adding general fund to the reach up debt ID will ensure that there are sufficient funds available to match the SNAP ENT um, work that we're doing, and it'll allow DCF to utilize revenue increases in the special funds to offset that general fund. So it doesn't have a programmatic impact. It just allows for some flexibility, and we, we can spend those TANF dollars in the CBD debt ID through well, subsidies. Thank you, for the, thank you for the detail, but what is the special fund? It's listed under SF that that 15 million is is being drawn from special fund. And I just don't know on here what special fund that is that you're that you're referring to. Is that education fund? Is that it's not tobacco because you have a line for that? No, it should just be a swap between uh, the way that the TANF plan works. I can get you the details and sure. Specific. Yeah, it is, it is a swap. It's a $15 million down in the general fund and it's a $15 million up in the special fund. I just don't know what special fund is, is being impacted. And we'll get, we'll get you that information. We'll get the information. Okay, yep. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Diane. Were you You're finished? Welcome. I'm finished, thank you, Chair. I, I have one question about uh, the change in use of the tobacco funds. Are there additional monies within the tobacco funds or, or are you um, making a change or a reduction in a, in a current uh, activity with the, the, those funds are being used to, um, used to fund a program? Sarah? Tom and Sarah, would you like me to respond to that? <laughs> Uh, Representative Toll, we are proposing to, um, I think revert is the right word, revert three and a half million dollars from substance use disorder workforce funds. If you recall, there was a five million dollar appropriation, um, I think it was two years ago for substance yeah. use disorder workforce. And so um, as part of this proposal from the governor, we are proposing to revert three and a half million dollars of that appropriation that has um, not been obligated or spent yet. And we would use 2 million of that, I think that's the right number, uh, Sarah and Sean, to cover this year of investment for the CCFAP. And the, the, those would be one-time dollars then? Correct. So um, the um, tobacco funds that are used for ongoing activities uh, are not being, those are not being chipped into. This was part of a, a five or $7 million uh, settlement that an additional settlement money that came in a couple of years ago. Correct, correct. Um, but I would, I should refer to my colleagues in finance and management about kind of any other details surrounding the tobacco fund. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to, oh, I, I have a couple more hands. Uh, uh, Representative Pugh and Representative Lanfer, your hand is lower, and I think it was up. Um, Anne? Um, I was just thinking that um, the next uh, topic that we have as it will be the health department. And um, some of the questions related to the tobacco fund and back to the, an initiative that this um, legislature has supported, which is increasing the um, and uh, supporting uh, workforce um, related to alcohol and drugs. Um, and unless those are not no longer a problem um, in the state, um, we might want to look at that. But those questions are probably better, if I might suggest, directed to the health department. Thank you, and you're correct. And it's fortuitous they're coming up next. So. We, we can do that. They're, they'll be here this, um, this morning. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
Um, again, uh, not a lot of significant change from the original governor's 21 recommended budget. Um, we are uh, proposing to move to a more electronic notification system. Um, we will be uh, submitting some uh, language regarding this proposal as well. Um, and then also, uh, again, just the allocation of the internal service fund reductions to the department being allocated to the different divisions based on their usage. Okay. <clears throat> uh, general assistance, the big change here is just that we're um, uh, in the original governor's recommend budget, we had uh, proposed moving all the uh, general assistance emergency housing over to Office of Economic Opportunity to be rolled into the Housing Opportunity Grant Program. Um, given um, where we're at and the conversation we had earlier this morning, um, we're, this just moves that money back to the Emergency Housing Program with the understanding that we'll be operating it um, for the remainder of 21. This is simply delaying it until you yep. approve the 22 yep. budget. Exactly. Um, uh, here we have, again, um, uh, you know, we have our, our uh, reach up caseload increases. Um, you know, we have uh, the increase projected from July to December, which we, um, the use of CRF funds. And then um, we're projecting a continued caseload increase um, through January through June, which you would see um, uh, with the general fund. Um, just given the CRF funds can't be used uh, past uh, the end of December, I think December 30th. And then here just um, again, a net, a net neutral, but m the movement of, uh, of, of TANF money in response to the, the TANF five-year plan. Um, happy to discuss e each of those in more detail. Um, in terms of downs, again, um, the internal service funds, um, and then um, we also have um, OCS disregard, um, new revenue coming in that allows us to off some general fund with um, the federal stimulus payment and the increased um, child um, uh, unemployment benefits to subcontractors, but also the increase uh, in the normal unemployment. We have seen an uptick in in the amount of revenue we're bringing into the state for um, to reimburse the state for ongoing reach up benefits that are being paid out, but also for uh, collection on arrears that were owed. And so under law, we're required to intercept those payments. And so we are seeing an increase based on some of the federal stimulus payments. Um, and then again, just moving um, the Department of Labor MOU from the reach up depth ID to the admin to reflect that. Um, that MOU is serving programs greater than just reach up, but it's much serving the, the three squares from op program as well. Um, uh, Representative Lemfer. Thank you. Thank you. So Sean, um, back on the uh, general assistance where you have the revert emergency housing, that $6 million where where um, the original proposal had about three or four lines. I just wanna make sure that there was, a re there was a proposal to reduce the rental assistance by $200,000 originally. Is that being restored with, within that six or is it just the other items? So we, don't have um, in terms of the, the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program, um, we bolstered that through the agency rehousing plan. If you'll remember, there was some additional CRF funding yeah. allocated there for the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program so that we can meet the need there. Um, and then in terms of um, whether it's still a down over the long term, yeah. I, I, you know, we'll need to just evaluate. Uh, I'll need to look at that and get back to you on how that's impacted okay. in the research. All right, thank you, sir. So, uh, that brings up a question, Commissioner, for me that um, there's a lot to tease out here because CRF funds were also used for micro businesses and, 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 you know, in other areas. And so not only do we need to know the initiatives that aren't highlighted here that were highlighted in January, but then what initiatives were addressed within um, CRF dollars <clears throat> and then what initiatives are still on the table that we need a reminder about. Sure. Um, and so <clears throat> there's a lot of 
uh, teasing out all of these moving pieces. And we're going to need, um, I'm sure we can depend on it. We need the departments as a, <clears throat> a dancing partner because of, of such times constraints. And so uh, off, offline, there's going to need to be a lot of conversation about what's in, what's out, what's been covered and <clears throat> what hasn't been highlighted. I absolutely and I agree, and we're, we're more than happy to meet um, uh, with committee members to kind of provide that level of detail in, in, um, in the coming weeks. A absolutely happy to do that. Uh, thank you. I want to just, uh, I, I just to put a time frame um, so that you understand the House time frame. I'm looking at um, possibly uh, having a budget ready to pass out on the 4th of September. So the coming weeks is really the coming days. Okay. Because uh, we Absolutely. have, a, we, have, we, you know, Labor Day could mess us up, but that's after that date. Um, and so we, we really don't have, I think we have like 10 days actually. Okay. We'll, we'll make that, those meetings a priority on our end for sure. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Teresa. Or is this, you move there, okay. Uh, OEO, again, just it, uh, moving the money, emergency housing money out of their budget um, over back to the GA debt ID for emergency housing program to continue this year. And then also just internal service fund reductions. Um, and again, the, 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 the broader conversation we're having here in terms of the detail of the original governor's rec, we will provide that level of detail for you as well. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Let's move to the next slide. Oh, you're here, okay. Okay, right. Uh, weatherization, um, again, just uh, no, no changes here in the restatement, just uh, the internal service fund reduction here, and not a significant sum of money. Nice. Uh, Mary, then, you have a question? Sorry, I can't raise my hand. I thought we got a lot of LIHEAP money in earlier, and I'm surprised not to see it reflected here. We did receive some, some federal stimulus LIHEAP money. I think it was about $4.6 million. Um, and so we will be rolling that out um, in uh, for the upcoming fuel season. Um, just in general, we're looking at a very robust uh, fuel benefit this year. Um, if the federal government maintains the block grant at its current level, and then with the additional money we received at the end of that 4.6 at the end of the fuel season, and then with refunds, um, we are looking at a very healthy uh, fuel benefit for households um, this coming winter. So I, I'm sorry, I don't remember where the LIHEAP money is reflected in your budget. Um, I don't believe it's reflected in here right now and we'll, and we'll make sure we make that, um, evaluate that and, and get it in here um, if it's missing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we're on to the Woodside. Slide. Yes, Woodside is, is a much larger conversation. Um, we, we are proposing to move forward uh, with the closure in the coming months um, if, um, if the legislature um, moves forward with it as well. Um, our budget reflects um, some downs of, um, of eliminating staff, um, also um, the, the, cost, the cost of mothball that was in the original governor's rec. Um, so, but we are restoring the maintenance of that um, budget as well, because it had been projected it was going to close. And so there's an up in there for the maintain the operations, um, and then also to move forward with the replacement. We are pursuing um, a, a strategy of, of working with a community partner to um, open up a uh, you know five to eight bed secure residential treatment program in state that would meet all of our, our needs and the youth needs, particularly around um, serving kids that we 
work with through an MOU with DOC, the Department of Corrections, kids who are in there, uh, the Commissioner of Corrections Care and Custody, as well as uh, kids placed with us th through the juvenile justice system. Um, and it's incredibly important um, that we be able to meet those youth's needs in state, and that's what we're moving towards, but also that the provider understand um, that that um, means um, that, that they are the facility that, that cannot reject or eject our, our children that are uh, need that high level of secure residential care. Um, we've been in a uh, conversation with Beckett, who has proposed operating a facility in Vermont. Um, we toured um, that facility last week. Um, it, I'll, I'll say it's an amazing campus and facility, incredibly therapeutic where, where it's located. Um, we are moving forward to doing a building assessment on what, uh, with an architect, on what it will take to provide uh, some enhanced security to meet the needs of, for the level some of our kids need who will be placed there, um, and then get a cost estimate. And we're reserving some funds here to, for that work within this budget, but also um, to meet the short-term needs of our kids. We are uh, negotiating with uh, Sununu right now. We have one youth placed in the Sununu facility in New Hampshire. Um, we're contracting to have the capacity to place up to five youth there um, if we are not able to locate an appropriate uh, placement either in-state or another out-of-state facility that might better meet those kids' needs um, a as um, a place that we could place kids while we develop um, this um, community-based secure residential program, which would be a facility secure, not a staff secure facility. Um, what I would say is, is that the facility they're proposing to use would allow us to expand um, into other areas of treatment services for Vermont youth, which might, uh, in terms of a non-secure residential facility, um, it's, a, it, um, um, it's, it's a actually a, a highly versatile um, building and property. And so we uh, might be able to continue and um, bolster our efforts to bring more kids out of state over the long term and treat them um, uh, with appropriate services in Vermont. And so this is an exciting proposal that we're working on right now. And I'm confident that um, we should hopefully will have it up and running in the next nine to 12 months. And that's our goal right now. And that's what we're working towards. Thank you. I'm sure there's going to be uh, many questions um, regarding Woodside and um, I, I'd like to just do the last slide and then uh, open it up to uh, questions. We have about 15 minutes, but then we're going to run right into um, the healthcare testimony. So I, I really would like to uh, just do a quick overview and then have the conversations regarding the concerns and changes and what we agree with to happen at a, a later time. So let's do this. Slide. Sure. Um, disability determination, really, this is um, primarily a federally funded program and regulated program, very little GF in it. And so you'll see um, we're projecting a down of $51 due to the allocation of the internal service fund reductions to, to uh, the disability uh, determination unit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for, um, I'm, I just I'm sorry, for the, um, the Committee of Jurisdiction that's with us, that the Human Services Committee, um, I, there's, I, I see many concerns um, that our committee and your committee need to deal with and, and you know, fully understanding all the pieces that may not have been included in these slides. Um, for time's sake, I'm hoping, Teresa, can you bring us back to the whole screen so I can, we can all see each other? Thank you. For time's sake, because it's very it's very tight on time, I'm hoping that Kimberly, as this is her budget, that she can join in. And when your committee has DCF in to roll through some of these finer policy points and what you agree with and don't agree with, um, we I, I just want to reiterate the time schedule and what we're hoping to get. We are not asking for formal memos from any committee. But I, I would like if we could just have an email of the things that uh, we agree upon and don't agree upon so that we can start making some budget decisions. And um, today, is, uh, today is Thursday. Next Thursday and Friday, we have public hearings so that we can hear from advocates in the public. 
Um, and I, I believe committees are, will be starting, I don't know when you're starting your testimony, Ian, but we're technically all back together on Tuesday the 25th. I'm hoping to get from most committees um, their direction and their thinking on Tuesday and Wednesday of the 1st and 2nd of September. And I know this is an incredibly tight timeline, um, but if, if we are to get the budget out of our committee on Friday the 4th and no later than the 8th, um, we can't uh, do much on Monday the 7th because it's Labor Day. And so we, if we came in on Tuesday to pass it out, all of our work would have to be done on the 4th anyway in order to read a version and pass it out by the 8th. And, and so we're really looking at all feedback uh, on the 1st or 2nd of September, which is, I'm not setting the timeline. So, so don't use the messenger. And that's a, a bad thing to say. I shouldn't have said that, I apologize. Um, I, I just wanted to make that timeline very clear. And, and Kimberly, if, if you could uh, start your work with House Human Services, um, that's going to expedite as well as um, you know conversations, knowing what the Senate is doing. There's, there's many things we may be able to get on the same page very quickly. So I have two questions, uh, one from um, uh, Representative McFawn, and then we'll go back to uh, the Chair of Human Services to wrap this up. Topper? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I, I think it's imperative that uh, for, in order for us to do our work, that the kinds of things that you asked for in terms of the side-by-side -side and the highlighting and so on, that our committee get that same kind of detail mm -hmm. so we can move forward. So I, I just put that in. Yep. Uh, for me, we need that in order for us to do our work. Yep. We're a team right now, Topper. So what gotcha. we will get I like that. I like the team <laughs> thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this is the only it's way we've been that way. Done so quickly. And, and um, so um, we will make sure Sarah, Sarah and Sarah um, and um, Sean, whatever you send to uh, Teresa, uh, be sure to send it to both committees. That would be. Absolutely, yep. Representative Pugh. Um, thank you, Representative Toll. And if I might say, great minds think alike because part of my <clears throat> final comments were would be that members of your committee, whether they were connected to DCF, which is the content here, um, or not in terms of the, their budget area, and, I'm asked lots of really good questions. And oftentimes um, when individuals ask questions, the response is to them. And so I, I, I would request that um, whatever information you are giving, that you give it to both committees, which is both what um, Representative McVaughn and you, Representative Toll, said. And um, given the time frame, um, uh, our committee um, is meeting three times next week. Um, we're meeting on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Tuesday, we'll need to deal with um, a small policy change language related to family um, child care. Um, but so, uh, Commissioner, in terms of um, the DCF material, whether it's the side by side in terms of January as well as where some of the COVID um, initiatives came in. Um, we need that by Wednesday morning so that okay. we can um, have that. And we will, um, uh, legislative council is in an all day, I mean, legislative, um, the committee assistant, um, Julie Tucker is in an all day meeting today. So she hasn't been able to connect with you, but we are meeting from 10 uh, on, hmm, sorry, on Thursday. So it's, we're Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So actually you have till Thursday morning. Um, 10.30 to 12.30, we will be meeting and um, uh, we would hope that you can come. I look forward to it. And if that side by side is ready before that, our committee, you know, will will take it earlier so that we can look it over and you know they can be prepared. 
uh, but um, I'm, it's, um, I'm, that's, I just want to make sure I have plenty of time. Uh, I'm just, this, this calendar is making me tremendously um, uneasy. And so, so if, if I if I may, Representative Toll, I have reached out to Finance and Management and the Joint Fiscal Office. I'd like to brainstorm on like the easiest ways to be able to get you this information that you need in order to build your budget. I fully understand your your timeline, um, and so uh, I'll circle back with you once I have a better kind of sense of the plan and how we can provide that information to you expeditiously. And Sarah, perhaps you know this because you have an overview of all of AHS. Are there more moving pieces in DCF than other budgets? Is this the more complicated of all the budgets or are they all going to come in at this level? Yeah, I'd say as a general rule, DCS budget is pretty much probably always the most complicated across state government. Um, so it certainly is the, the probably the most challenging to lay it out. But I think for sure across the agency, there are other pieces that you will wanna review of. I think some of the departments will be able to do that for you more straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm kind of thinking right now is you, my presentation that I that I usually give to the committees that has a very high level overview um, of the entire budget is updating that to reflect items that are the same from the GovRec and items that have changed to kind of give you a sense and a refresher of what was originally included and what has changed. And then you'll be able to kind of put them on top of each other because the restatement really reflects the delta from the GovRec. And so what I'm understanding, we need to go back to the GovRec and make sure that we have a full understanding of what was in the GovRec and then the move forward. So it, it's it's complicated, and? but we can get there. Um, Representative, well, the only, my only question is we did pass a quarter budget and whether there was anything in that quarter budget that we passed that was potentially to set the stage for the three quarters budget that may or may not be consistent with what the what was in January's. The Actually, I just want to make a clarification there, Anne, and I didn't mean to cut you off. It, the administration, when they presented uh, the budget to our committee, they wanted us to be very careful um, in the term three quarter. They said they no longer have a three quarter budget they're, they're doing a full year budget and for us to anticipate changes to decisions we made in the quarter budget. So that's even another level of complexity. We have to you know, pay attention to the proposal in January, the delta of what changed in January, what we passed uh, in the quarter budget, what they're going, uh, you know, what changes now there are to the quarter budget. And so there's, um, it, it becomes much more, I mean, there's, certainly many levels of, of uh, that makes it much more complicated. Didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I, we, I just want, it's never a three quarter budget, uh, at least now it's, it's a full year budget with changes to what we did in the quarter. So we need to fully understand those two. Thank you for reminding me to say that. Um, I think that um, we are um, out, out of time. Um, there's many things that I've written down, the changes from January, uh, the school age child care hub, CCFAP, the lost federal dollars, what are we leaving on the table with some of these reductions, um, caseload increases and in reach up, what are those looking like, the tobacco funds that are being used for CCFAP, exactly where those funds are coming from, do we still have capacity in those funds? where they identified for other areas. Um, the accounting of, oh, that, that was a note for me, and the Woodside phase down and replacement. Um, were there any other big issues um, that I didn't mention? Um, you know, I think the, uh, the BFIS and transportation are issues. Uh, any of the supportive housing, emergency housing? Um, that you see that there's concerns that you'll be addressing, Anne? Should they be on the list? Um, I'll put housing and then- Put housing, uh, um, given what we have on our plate, I may be talking with House General as to if they can pick up some of this. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thank you. And Sarah and Sarah, thank you for coming in. And um, we look forward to your continued conversation in human services and
Kimberly, once again, you have a plate full. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Nice to see all of you. And thank nice you, Matt, you all. services for joining us. And thank you. Um, it is, it Madam, is. Madam Chair, can I just say this is one of those situations where the link does not change and the policy committee does not change and uh, we will run right to Department of Health when you're ready. Okay, uh, are we, is the um, healthcare, is the healthcare committee joining us as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I don't believe so. For the most part, the Department of Health um, language falls and uh, money falls under human services. It is uh, DIVA as that relates to um, healthcare that is the jurisdiction of the healthcare committee. Okay. Yes, and mental health, they will um, they be. And so I see uh, Commissioner Levine and I see Paul Daly and Tracy Dolan. I'm wondering if you would entertain us just standing up for four minutes, starting at 20 after, um, so that we can have a bit of a break before we um, uh, go until 1130, which we have a, another schedule. Uh, so I, I would just like a four minute break and we'll start at uh, 1020. It's now a three minute break. And uh, can I just let people know that I'm not going to go off YouTube because it um, okay. No, nope, that's you want to just uh, t turn off their videos or and mute themselves until. No, I just uh, I just asked the commissioner that I just wanted to give him a heads up that I was going to ask him about the uh, the initiative in the original budget regarding the sustained home visiting for newborns expansion, and so uh, he'll be prepared to to answer. I didn't ask him to answer it now. Just uh, wanted to have him be prepared for. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I think that um, if we could turn some videos back on, I think that we are close to starting. And Peter, this is your budget. Okay, I think we need yes. to get started. Uh, Representative, not Representative Levine, Commissioner Levine. Uh, welcome, and uh, I, personally, right. I personally want to thank you, and on behalf of the, the committees and the members, the incredible amount of work that you have been doing over the past um, many, many weeks, and um, the trust that Vermonters have in you and your presentations and the messages, and um, you, you deserve a lot of the credit for Vermont being as safe and uh, and unfortunately, we're, we're really an attractive place for people to come now. And so that, that works on both sides, but I really appreciate your efforts, your expertise, your calmness, and uh, your ability to um, effectively get messages to Vermonters and they're listening and thank you. Thank you. I'll try to maintain that calmness during the budget presentation. <laughs> and it's been many months, not weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, it has been months. That's, that's right. It, um, but, but thank you. So um, we, um, we uh, ha are doing a joint meeting so that the committees of jurisdiction can hear the budgets because we're on an extremely accelerated time frame. And we fully understand that uh, the budget, the, the presentation is, is, a, is a, a restatement of the proposals in January. What did just come to our attention with DCF is there may be some proposals that there were no changes and so they aren't highlighted in the presentation, but we need a full understanding of the entire uh, change from fiscal year 20 to 21 that this is not a three quarter budget, but actually what the governor and, and the administration has proposed is uh, a full year budget that, that um, can also make changes to what we did um, in the quarter year budget that, that ends at the end of, uh, end of September. So um, we, I know you may not have all of that before you, but at some point, and Sarah Clark is going to help work with this, um, are there initiatives that that were proposed in January that aren't highlighted that we need to still be aware of. And so I think with that, uh, welcome and you have your team with you. Let's start walking through the budget and Representative Pugh, uh, do you have some remarks you would like to make before we get started as chair of human services? Um, 
Thank you, Representative Toll. And I have nothing to add except to add my voice and the voice of Human Services and all of Vermont, um, Dr. Levine, to you and your um, all of your staff in, in your response um, and the guidance and leadership that you've provided since uh, the end of February. Thank you. Makes a village, does take a village. Okay, so Teresa, do you, you have a document and we will uh, start with the presentation and uh, you are on commissioner, welcome. Thank you. So it's, it, our, our uh, presentation is rather simple. Um, so it's hard uh, to even simplify it further from what's written before you on the screen. Um, obviously the state funding reduction is $1.1 million and the majority of that we hope um, $850,000 to be specific uh, results from the delayed implementation of the expanded home visiting program. Keep in mind, this was a, a very dear to our heart program and still is, um, but at the same time, uh, the work of COVID has uh, disrupted, if you will, uh, the work on the expansion of the program. That was in theory going to begin in July Fiscal year 21 cost would be a million dollars in state funds, but planning on the work had to be delayed because of our mobilization for the pandemic response. So if we uh, propose that we're unable to begin the expansion of the program before the fourth quarter of fiscal year 21, we just need to incorporate that reality into the budget which is predominantly a reduction in the global commitment budget in our public health appropriation by $1.8 million. Just to finish it off, there is internal service charges that are slightly lower, a revised estimate of the federal share of department administration costs, that's our first appropriation, the administration appropriation, that make up the balance of the savings and bring us up to the appropriate amount. So that's really uh, in a nutshell. Okay, hey, are, are, are there questions before we uh, move on to um, uh, other initiatives that are that are now on the screen. Any questions about the the delay in the home visiting program, or the IFS charge? And the third piece, I I Teresa, I didn't write it down before the screen moved, and I haven't copied this paper. The third was um, um, a revised estimate of federal share of department administration costs. So I, I Peter, I see your hand is up, Representative Finnegan. Yes, thank you. So, Doctor, just to be just to be clear, the 375 um, newborns that are currently being visited are continued uh, to be visited. The the uh, the delay is the addition of the 550 newborn cases that that were was to be added on. Am I correct? Yeah, I honestly don't remember the exact number of newborns, but I think you're in the ballpark. Okay. Um, it's the expansion, not the de not decimating the current program. Okay, thank you. Let's see. I don't see any other hands up. So, um, Commissioner, if you'd like to move on to the next piece, thank you. Sure. This is more to bring you up to date on projects that uh, were legislatively authorized by the General Assembly. So three programs, the COVID response telehealth connectivity program, health disparities related to COVID-19, and EMT and paramedic training. 
These are all authorized by various uh, pieces of legislation. Um, and each one of them is in a different phase, but they're all incredibly early in their phases of being able to even uh, implement them in terms of negotiating subgrants, um, applications for tuition support, grant agreement completion. So we're, we're in that early phase of trying to implement what's in the uh, legislation. Okay, thank you. I am again looking for hands from committee members if there are questions there. I think a, oh, Representative Fagan. Thank you. And doctor, this is, these questions are not, are not directly related to what you've just presented, but certainly speaks to the tremendous amount of work and the outstanding response that, that uh, you and the Department of Health have, have uh, provided to the state of Vermont because of COVID. Um, the, is the Vermont Emergency Operations Center still up and running? The SEOC? Yes. Absolutely. And is that staff 24-7, 365? I, uh, I believe so. It's, uh, often vir it's often virtual, but yes. Okay, so you, you have somebody on the line or some bodies on the line 24-7, 365 to ensure Vermonters uh, get appropriate response in a quick time frame. I could say that, yeah. Okay, I just, just you know, I, this is what I had understood, and I just wanted to ask the questions to to ensure that that everyone understands the type of commitment that that responding to COVID has taken. And so, really, um, you know, for all of Vermont, as as Representative Pugh said, thank you, thank you, you've yeah. um, you've saved our bacon, so to speak. And there is a uh, health operations center technically speaking, separate from the SEOC that is also completely operational and has been since close to the beginning of the year. Thank you. Representative Pugh, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I have what might be a, a broad question and maybe it's unfair given the fact that you all are moving as fast as you can, but I'm thinking um, or worrying about the future and whether or not this budget um, has sufficient financial resources um, from the state um, to enable the health department to uh, respond to what many are um, assuming will be um, continued um, uh, issues with COVID-19 for at least till January, if not through uh, the rest of the um, fiscal year. Yeah, I, I like your concern. Um, I don't wanna blow off your concern, um, but at the same time, there is abundant federal funding coming to the department and coming to the state um, in the form of originally a public health emergency response uh, effort, then the CARE supplement, the coronavirus relief fund allocation, and the newest grant, which is the ELC, the Epidemiology and Lab Capacity Enhancing Detection Supplement. So amongst all of those, um, there are many millions of dollars coming into the state. Some of them are on funding timelines, so we need to spend certain ones earlier than others. We feel that at the rate we're spending money now, we could potentially have adequate funding until the fall of 2022. That's, um, I appreciate that. And in terms of the uh, yeoman's job that your staff have been doing, um, are there public health functions that 
um, we have had to curtail or significantly reduce that uh, perhaps um, Vermonters would be better served if we were able to have some of them start up again, um, whether it is, yeah. Yeah, so to give you a flavor, over a three month period, um, the health department accrued a level of overtime that would be equivalent to 36 FTEs. Um, we have abundant people who have their usual job completely subsumed by their coronavirus effort. Others are uh, still able to maintain their regular job without doing too much in the coronavirus sphere. Others are trying their hardest to do a fragment of their usual job while they're contributing to the coronavirus effort. Some of this will improve uh, as positions that have been approved from our ELC grant come to fruition. Um, but the reality is it is an all hands on deck effort. Um, I wouldn't wanna say that there are any programs that have completely just been abandoned uh, and we're not paying any attention to, um, but certainly um, the level of effort has proportionately decreased as the effort in the pandemic response has increased. Uh, no question about that. Um, but you know, many, many programs are still ongoing. Um, we have worked with the uh, Department of DHR to uh, make sure that uh, positions are taken very seriously. And when we're looking for funding for positions that perhaps we've asked for in the past um, uh, unsuccessfully, but that are critical to our current effort, that they be re-examined in a different light and they have been. Uh, likewise, the funding from federal grants for newer positions uh, we've had a much more streamlined uh, acceptance of, of those uh, so that we can, be the, we can get, be, begin the process of uh, integrating those positions into our effort. So um, I wouldn't want to say that we've dropped the ball on anything by any means, um, but people are proportionately doing less in many cases on those efforts because of their need to be involved in the pandemic response. Hope that answers your question adequately. It's fine. People may ultimately have other questions. Um, a representative Toll, I'm not sure this is the place to ask the question about the um, uh, tobacco fund and the, um, the 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 money that had been appropriated over several years but not spent in terms of substance use workforce and how that is being, um, what was the word used? Reclaimed, reallocated. Reallocated. Re re reallocated. Um, i.e. taken away from the Department of Health and Alcohol and Drugs and putting it somewhere else. And so I'm curious as to um, uh, how we're doing, and Representative Toll, if this is not the place to ask that, we can, I think it's on the table, so let's ask it at this point. It's out there, so let's let's you know okay. use our time and and let's ask it in. Okay. So um, I guess, Commissioner, I am um, surprised. I, I will say that what um, was for several years one of the major um, public health issues in the state, which is substance use. Um, disorder, individuals um, experiencing substance use disorder and the need for um, uh, keeping people in the state who um, can provide those services or to provide um, school loans and grants to increase the workforce, um, certainly that is no longer a need. So our alcohol and drug abuse program section as one of those sections that actually has continued to operate uh, very close to the way it operated previously before the pandemic 
I think we're all aware that we're in the midst of a very challenging time for people who have mental health issues or who have and or who have substance use disorder issues. We've seen a spike in uh, unintentional overdoses with opioids. Um, other, to, other, other uh, substance uses don't stop because we're in a pandemic. Often they get aggravated. Often the stress of the pandemic alone increases some of the maladaptive behaviors that people uh, would normally uh, exhibit uh, to a higher degree now. And it increases the levels of anxiety and depression that would increase the level of uh, substance use that could be driven by those forces. People are also more isolated. And as they get more isolated, they have less resources to draw upon, or they at least think they have less resources to draw upon. And they may also, if they're using injection drugs, use those in isolation and not have anyone there to rescue them, so to speak, if they overdose. And finally, um, there were times that we've been given many vivid stories about where people's supply chains have changed, uh, especially when people were in the stay at home mode uh, and they didn't even know what they were using sometimes because of the fact that um, they, they were basically uh, using what they could get a handle on and it may have been adulterated with who knows what. So all of our connections with those treatment networks have continued. And all of our usual work with recovery centers and their efforts to keep people in uh, recovery have continued. All of our work with naloxone distribution, none of that's really changed. The preferred provider network is uh, alive and well and being communicated with, with ADAP on a weekly basis. Um, and obviously all of the usual partners that we uh, engage in the harm reduction arena uh, continue on as well. The thing I'm not as familiar with and I, we, we have to look into unless one of my colleagues on the call has information is some of those uh, workforce expansion items you're talking about. Because um, I don't believe that those monies would have just disappeared, uh, although I'm not sure that uh, certainly, there hasn't been a focus uh, that people have been paying attention to. So um, unless um, Tracy or Paul has anything to add regarding those, I, I'm not sure I can respond directly on that one. Commissioner, the, um, the this was brought to our attention with, the, we just heard the DCF budget. And part of the DCF budget, there was a uh, mention that uh, there's going to be a reversion of $3.5 million there was some uh, substance abuse disorder funds that came in as a as one time money from um, a, a few years ago for workforce um, for you know to beef up our workforce and two million of that was going to be used to cover CCFAP. We know these are one time funds, but we also uh, we need to get an accounting for ourselves from the JFO um, committee, the JFO office. I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm that what was the balance of these funds and, and um, what had we as a legislature had a priority for how they should be used. And th there were two pots of money. One was for, um, the, for the justice system and one was for um, SUD workforce. And so that, that's, that's the question. And, and we also, I just, and I had asked the question um, that are any of the programs that the tobacco money, any of the tobacco fund dollars that are used for um, prevention programs, uh, um, you know, addiction programs, that that has not been decreased. Have those pro th those tobacco dollars are, are completely different dollars. This is a question and they have not yeah. been decreased. Is that correct? I'm not aware that they've been decreased. Uh, uh, my financial director, Paul Daly, is on the phone. Are you aware of any? change in those funds? Uh, Representative Toll, your understanding is correct. There are no changes to the health department's tobacco control program funding in the FY20 budget, it was, or in the FY21 budget. It's level funded as just as in the original proposal. 
What we're and talking about is one-time funds that were appropriated to AHS. Okay, and so the, the 3.5 that Representative Pugh was talking about that was focused on SUD workforce, uh, the total of that was, was it 5 million? There was if one- If it's helpful, can I, or I'll let maybe Representative Fagan speak. Okay, <laughs> okay Peter, you're there. No, it is, it was 5 million. It was the 2017, 2018 fiscal year. Um, and we were working with those funds earlier in the year before COVID to, uh, to try to stand up some uh, nurse training. So uh, that, that bill remains over in the Senate. Uh, I have no idea what the status of it is. And, I'm tr and I've been communicating with Sarah to try to ascertain a few things and we'll continue to do so. Okay, and you will also keep Representative you apprised of, of your conversations and involved in those conversations. Will do. In the nurses, in the nurses training, that was one million out of those. Is that correct, Sarah? That is correct. Okay. In the balance that we had, was any of the SUD money used, or was there a full five million dollar balance? If I may, can I run through kind of <clears throat> quickly the status of that five million dollars, if that's yes. helpful, and then I can follow up with a spreadsheet. So there was originally $5 million appropriated from these uh, tobacco funds for substance use disorder workforce investments. Mm -hmm. um, I think as the committees are aware, there were a few iterations in terms of work that the AHS did in partnership with the legislature to get the money out the door. So of the $5 million, there is still a million and a half available underneath this construct at the Agency of Human Services to be invested in SUD workforce. I believe the intention now from the, the where the legislation last lay related to these funds is that they will be provided to the designated agency system um, to enhance their workforce. Um, so million and a half for that same original purpose. This budget, this restated budget and the governor recommend proposes to revert the remaining three and a half million dollars meaning it won't be for the original purpose of that appropriation. Three and a half million would stay in the tobacco fund. Of that three and a half million, we are proposing to use two million of that to cover the child care financial assistance program investments that were in the GovRec budget, originally funded by the education fund. I believe it was tied to um, gaming um, and since we, we know that that's not moving forward in this restatement, given the kind of economic situation that we're in, um, we are proposing to use 2 million from these tobacco funds. It was, it was originally proposed funding. We never actually funded it through the education committee through any kind of gaming it, it a proposal. It, exactly, exactly. Um, so, but that does still leave remaining in the tobacco fund, a million and a half dollars. And I didn't mean to, uh, to uh, step in, I just had some confusion. Did you, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, this is fine, thank you. Okay, um, and so I have some, uh, I have three other hands up. Uh, Peter, did you have uh, your hand up for a different piece? Different question, yes. Okay. So this is, um, just regarding general use of, of CRF funding, um, you, doctor, you spoke to uh, the fact that um, 36 FTEs worth of overtime have been uh, have been performed by your staff during the uh, during this crisis, and that uh, many members of your staff's uh, time have been completely subsumed by working on the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, and then others, uh, a portion of their time, uh, been used to to respond to the, the crisis. Um, are we able to pay those individuals normal salaries out of CRF such that we could see a down in the general fund budget here? Now, obviously the overtime is, that's all CRF eligible and, and I'm going to, and I, while I don't see anything as far as the documents stating that we're paying them CRF, um, I certainly remember voting on bills that, that, that would indicate that, but, um, what about their their normal salaries for because they were working on uh, on COVID? Representative Fagan, this is Paul Daly. I could answer that question. 
in fiscal year 20, between February and June, uh, we spent about just under $10 million on the response. And about half of that was from a CDC grant that came in, in early in the uh, outbreak, and the balance had, was funded with CRF. And under the CRF rules, uh, public health agencies are assumed to be substantially dedicated to the pandemic response. So all of our staff costs that are working on the response are eligible under the CRF and have been charged uh, since about um, May and will continue to be until our allocation is used or until we get to December 30th. Okay, but wouldn't that then free up a significant amount of general funds that normally would go to uh, salary? It did in fiscal year 20, Representative Fagan, and that those funds were reverted to help okay. uh, balance this year's budget. Yeah, uh, but what about 21? Because the, the, uh, the, the emergency continues. It's, we expect that that'll happen, but as Dr. Levine noted, our hope is that we'll be able to get more and more of our folks back to their regular jobs where they'll be charged into the, what was budgeted uh, for in 21. But we do expect that there will be lower spending overall in state funds in 21 than, we're, than are in our base budget right now. So is the intent then right now to, to true it up in the budget adjustment? Uh, or could you give us a, an estimate of funds that, uh, that uh, could be reduced now uh, for, for, you know, for other purposes? Representative Fagan, we're not, I, I'll speak for myself, I'm not comfortable forecasting financials related to COVID for more than about three days in advance right now. That's how uncertain things are. I can understand that. Okay, so that, so that would then indicate that it would be a true up in the budget adjustment. Okay. Or possibly Thank a closeout. Okay. Thank you. Representative Bruns Brumstead. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I wanted to ask Dr. Levine a little bit about the vaccine piece that you had talked about earlier. But before I did that, I just wanted to say thank you again. I feel like if you had come into our committee room, I would have, and I think our group would have given you a standing ovation for the most incredible work over the last um, how many months. So yes, I would say thank you, thank you, thank you. You have been terrific. You've been great on all the press conferences. You, you've just done a great job. and. Um, as a state, as a member of this state, as a, um, just thank you. So my question about vaccines is you did have a little section there about vaccines in your pre earlier presentation, but I wondered, there's been a lot of conversation about the flu vaccine and how important it is going to be, especially I would believe in our schools as we open our schools and so forth. So in September, when we're all being recommended to um, be vaccinated. And this, I guess, is not the 21 budget, but I wonder if you're thinking about at all the way we did with H1N1, where we had the vaccine given in the schools in order to ensure that we were really catching a lot of the kids. And are we thinking in that direction? And are you thinking about funds in order to be able to do that and who to work with? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, I thought you were going to ask about the COVID vaccine. Um, but that's a hypothetical right now, though everyone seems to be so enthused about it and the progress that's being made. So with regard to the flu, um, it's going to be a true partnership opportunity uh, because all of the possibilities need to be explored. Uh, as you know, uh, schools were and could still be a major locus for where vaccines uh, can be available and working with the school nurses is something that our health department is constantly doing anyways. Um, the pharmacies have already been rather um, front and center and forward in the national scene, talking about the roles they can play. And as you know, there was legislation regarding uh, vaccination of those under age 18 uh, in pharmacies. Uh, so pharmacies need to continue to play a role. And then obviously the entire healthcare system, uh, specifically in the primary care sector, uh, but potentially beyond that as well. Um, because you're right, the biggest effort has to be early and 
a high uptake of flu vaccine, knowing, as some people are calling it, the twindemic is upon us, where we'll have concurrent flu and COVID. And uh, at least if we can try to do one thing, we can prevent the one we know we can uh, do a lot of good work to prevent now. Australia apparently did not have a huge flu season this year. A lot of people think some of that is because of the stringent uh, conditions that were typical of most countries at the point in time when flu would have been prevalent in Australia. So people weren't necessarily in contact with one another as much as they could have been. Um, so uh, remains to be seen what the experience in this country will be uh, regarding the flu. Um, don't want to base it all on the Southern Hemisphere. In terms of, you know, budgeting issues, you know, being a universal vaccine state, um, there's so much that's already been taken into account. So I think what you're referring to is more the implementation steps uh, of, of actually giving it to the population. And I, I'm just not sure. I, I, we have a whole work, working group looking at that right now in terms of just how do we deliver the vaccine in a way that it's never been delivered previously, the upfront and high uptake part of it. Um, but I'm not sure about the budgetary implications yet, um, to be to be candid. So I, I'm, and my concern would be mostly our children, only because our drugstores really haven't up to, haven't been taking that on. They don't want to give to under 18, and that makes it really difficult for families to balance how to do that. And um, yet, it's so important to keep our schools open because a kid could present with a fever because they have the flu. So I just think it's important to maybe think about dollars in that direction. Yeah, no, great suggestion. And certainly the schools are a big part of the focus. No question. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Feltis, your hand was up. You still have a question? No, Peter asked my question. I was concerned about not seeing a reduction in personnel services costs, but I understand that now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative McVaughn. Uh, you're still muted, Topper. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, doctor, for everything that you people have been doing. I have uh, one question. Um, DCF is about ready to uh, stand up some uh, 70 child care hubs. And uh, it will incorporate approximately 7,000 children. So if we're talking about 100 plus kids plus quite a bit of staff in these hubs. My, my question is, has your agency uh, been involved in the planning of these to make sure that whatever kind of facility is being used, it's appropriate? And also um, within that facility, can the protocols that um, the department has sent out, can they be followed? So I'm just wondering what yeah, I, I assume you've had some input, but I'd like to hear what it is. Yeah, so this was just debuted literally uh, 48 hours ago. So I can't give you a tremendous amount of answer to your question just yet. Um, our maternal child health division is int intimately involved with child care all the time wrote all the guidance for childcare during the pandemic. Um, so obviously we play a critical role. I'm not sure I could say in the last 48 hours um, that what we've done um, since, since the announcement came out and the initiative came out. Um, so I can get back to you on that because I really I, do. I, I would appreciate that. So, so it, at least for one, what I'm understanding right now is since you just heard about it, that maybe there was no input. Well, I mean, it's the agent, you mentioned our agency. I mean, we're, 
you know, we're a department within the Agency of Human Services. Obviously, the, the secretary and the agency were doing a lot of work. DCF uh, was a huge contributor and focus of that. Um, so you're right, we, we were not uh, intricately involved uh, at that stage. Uh, I think this has been pretty, like everything with the pandemic, this has been very rapidly um, laid out and being moved along. Dr. Levine, I, I wondered if I could just add one thing. Is sure. it okay if I add just one thing? While we might not have been involved in this one, in every initiative across state government that has required public health input around any kind of guidelines or what the public health impact has been, we've been pulled in every time. So I, I would not be surprised that the plan is to pull us in on the operationalization of this. But in every part of state government, um, they begin the work, then they come to us and say, can you look, is this in keeping with the guidelines? So we have been very involved and they do look for our final approval on many things that have any impact on public health and on COVID. So I would anticipate it would be a similar process here. Yeah, I, I sure hope so because this is a big deal. A lot of kids congregated in, in a, you need the right facility and everything. They've already, they know how many they're gonna have in each county as well. So they're pretty far along in this. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you have to also realize that all of the guidance for child care that's been ongoing prior to this latest initiative uh, has had public health input every step of the way. Um, and we actually refer to it all the time when people express concerns about opening the schools, you know, pre-K through 12. Uh, we're always referring to the experience we had with child care how we wrote the guidance regarding not only the hygiene and how the uh, uh, each facility worked, but more importantly, the people who were staffing the facilities, the number of children uh, to staff ratio, uh, and how all of that fit together. Uh, and so all of that guidance was really uh, from our department. So I can't believe any of that will be thrown out. Uh, it'll only be augmented, if anything else. May I just ask who that was? Who was that speaking? Dr. Levine. Oh, uh, Tracy no, Dolan, no. De Deputy Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you. I have a question on a different topic. Earlier, um, we were having a conversation about how you have heroically shifted resources to the pandemic. Clearly, you're going to continue doing that. I am concerned about the work that you are not able to do within the department. And I would like to understand that better in terms of the, well, I, I can't say it better than that. What are you not getting to that needs to be attended to? And I'm sure that's a huge question, but it matters. Yeah, and I'd hate to give you the impression that anything has been totally unattended because many of the things we do in our department rely on federal grants and one has to do a certain amount to honor the intent of those grants and to continue to reapplying for those grants and making sure that programs don't get interrupted uh, unintendedly. So uh, I, I would hate to think that there's anything specific that has had nobody's eyes on it uh, or participation in, in an ongoing effort. There's so much in public health that we are required to report on, that we're required to uh, maintain programming on, um, in our roles in, in health promotion and disease prevention that have to continue. Um, but, but they are continuing, you know, at some point, at some, in some places with um, less of the manpower than normally would be present. So perhaps the bare minimum as opposed to uh, abandonment altogether. Uh, so I wouldn't want you to think that uh, that's not happening. Like I mentioned in ADAP, uh, lots is still going on in a very ongoing way with tobacco prevention. Um, 
those programs have not, you know, been disturbed. And we have actually manpower who continue to work on those programs. Chronic disease prevention, um, there's uh, a lot of federal grant money with regards to um, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and those things are not stopping, even if we're not highlighting them all the time at this point in time during a pandemic response. And then, you know, COVID is an infectious disease, but there are many other infectious diseases that on an ongoing basis require health surveillance, whether they be sexually transmitted diseases, tuberculosis, et cetera. And um, none of that can stop either. I'd say the one area that I've definitely, we've had to reallocate some of the work is in our laboratory, because as you know, our laboratory is literally working it's not three shifts yet, but uh, it could be if we needed it to be with a surge uh, on providing this testing for COVID-19. There are other basic functions the lab has to continue to do during these seasons when we see various types of infections. But then there are other basic functions our lab does that we're actually shifting and allowing to go to other places. Uh, so our microbiologists and lab technicians can devote their time to the effort at hand. Uh, so that is one area where the work isn't stopping. It's just not happening within the context of our own laboratory anymore while it's so pressured by the needs for the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I, I could go on and on, you know, division by division, but I, I don't think I, I want you to come away with the impression that we haven't taken our eye off of any ball but many of them you're not gonna hear about with as much vigor from us uh, just because of the fact that people are so involved in the pandemic response. And in a couple of cases, uh, if I can just add on, the federal government has allowed us some waivers on some aspects. So WIC continues, but the federal government allowed us not to have to bring people in person to certify them. So that's been a piece of work that we've been able to delay while we still continue WIC. Um, lab testing is another area. Um, some evaluations that we planned, we pushed off. So it's some of the larger initiatives where we slow it down. We continue to do the program, but maybe a new piece or an evaluation or something that would have been more involved, we push off. And in, in a lot of cases, we're doing it in cooperation with our federal partners. Please, please don't understand me to be asking, to be critical of, of what you're doing. And I totally understand your effort to bring focus to those areas. My large concern, and, and I'll leave this to our policy committee to probe if they think it's appropriate, but the success of programs during the pandemic has been based on their resilience and robustness. And I'm really concerned that as we move to address this one urgent er area that we are reducing the capacity of our other systems and that some other unintended consequence will be coming in. I believe that we should be making deeper investments in public health rather than just trying to manage on what we have. And, and that's the source of my question. It's a big question. We can't talk about it in depth here, but if the policy committee thinks there's some value to it, I, I would hope that we would have a conversation about how we make those investments to assure the robustness of the entire system. And I, I do appreciate your intent. And uh, not only this august body, but clearly on a federal basis, um, the nation needs to learn its lessons from this pandemic. And one of those lessons is so well stated by you that upfront investment in public health will pay dividends when it's needed. Um, and a country that spends so little money on prevention in public health traditionally um, needs to understand uh, that this is an important investment that they are making, not just from an emergency preparedness standpoint, but from multiple other aspects of public health as well. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Uh, we have a question from Representative McFawn, and then we need to uh, uh, wrap this up as we have um, another uh, budget coming following right after yours. Uh, Topper? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is probably going to be a controversial question. Um, it's, doctor, um, with the, uh, the need uh, for us to I, I think there may be a need for us to look at um, the exemptions that are in place now for vaccinations, uh, especially with the flu. Um, I'm wondering if anybody in your department is thinking about recommending that we, as a legislature, take a look at um, some of the exemptions uh, in terms of vaccination, uh, i.e. the religious exemption. On top, uh, Representative McFawn, if I could just jump in here, um, I would be, and it, it, it's not being comfortable or uncomfortable and whether it's a hot topic, it, it's a, a topic that's not on the table and because our time frame is so short, um, okay. I wanna focus on the, the budget items and the policy items that are being, in, um, that are being included. And I, I think that um, this topic is one that that needs probably um, a full presentation on its own, and and to just um, to just uh, hit upon it quickly in a budget presentation, I'm afraid wouldn't give it the justice justice it needs for all sides that are listening in who are whose ears are really perked up now. And so, okay. I, I, that's that's fine, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just was referring to. The, the piece in, in the presentation about the importance of vaccinations and money and so on. So, okay, that's cool. Well, well let, let's, um, I, I think it's absolutely fair for the commissioner to respond to uh, the piece that's before us uh, with those vaccinations. Um, but but I, I don't wanna get into philosophical um, uh, exemptions, right. just exemptions, but absolutely, um, if there's more that you can respond to, Commissioner, on the piece that's in your presentation, please do do so. Yeah, no, it, it would be a much broader discussion, I think. Not the first time this question's been asked. Uh, so certainly fair game for us for, for a future time. Um, okay. Do you have more to add? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up on my iPhone your presentation because it's not in front of us. Um, where um, vaccines were were mentioned. Teresa, can you pull that back up? I can't find it on my iPhone right now. And the screen's too small. And by, I had, take one moment. It's the bottom of the first page. Oh, here it is, I've got it. Um, nope, it's, yep. And it's specific to COVID vaccine as opposed to any other vaccine. That's right. Um, okay, in the event that an immunization becomes available, right. uh, this is asking for um, um, the question of whether there'll be sufficient federal funding for those individuals seeking this vaccination. Is that Precisely. correct? Precisely. Okay. And I would anticipate there will be abundant federal funding, but it's very unclear to me uh, if we use the word sufficient, mm -hmm. you know, look in your crystal ball, um, it would be challenging to understand. I will say that we have uh, stood up an entire vaccine working group specifically not on the issues that Topper raised, but the issues that are raised in equitably dispersing uh, a vaccine for COVID to an entire population uh, and doing it in a way that um, gets it to the highest priority groups first, but gets it to everybody eventually and make sure that uh, equity considerations are always uh, front and center. But, you know, it's also looking at things like 
what are the uh, syringe needs, the needle needs? Um, do we, do, will we run out of those like the country ran out of PPE or uh, ran out of uh, certain reagents for testing? So trying to be as uh, proactive, if you will, as possible so that all the issues that we need to get our hands around are on the table ahead of whenever a vaccine's available and whenever any federal funding becomes uh, uh, ready for us to utilize. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Topper. Thank you, Topper, for the question. And um, as you said, so much of this is still looking into a crystal ball, not knowing what the fall is going to bring, not knowing <clears throat> the availability of a vaccine. Uh, not knowing who would be first in line. There, there's so many unanswered questions and what funding will be needed and how much will be available through federal dollars. Um, if, if money is needed, uh, obviously that would be a, a budget adjustment in January question or um, perhaps use of CRF dollars if, you know, to supplement other federal dollars. Uh, but I do think that we need to, the, to close um, this testimony as, as we are getting ready to hear uh, from mental health, which is coming, the Department of Mental Health, which is coming in next. Peter, you will work with uh, Representative Pugh and her committee. Um, there, there was the second page of the presentation that talked about some CRF um, funding initiatives, but the, the big pieces were the $1.1 million reductions, which really has to do with the delay of being able to uh, implement the home visiting program as well as two other smaller changes with IFS charges and um, the estimate changing with uh, the federal share of administrative costs. Um, Sarah Clark is working uh, other pieces um, of the uh, healthcare budget that were proposed in, um, in January that we will need to bring in as part of this discussion. And, and um, she is also working on a sheet that will update or overlap or make it very clear that the um, ups and down sheet that we're working off from now is based off January, but doesn't, doesn't reflect clearly the January over fiscal year 2020 to help us um, get a quick, clear understanding of the full year changes, not just the Delta from 2020. And so I want to thank the Human Services Committee. I want to thank the chair and thank you for working with us. We look forward to um, closing these off. If, if a budget like the healthcare closes out more quickly than maybe the DCF, if you could shoot us an email with things that you're comfortable with, uh, the faster we get it, the faster uh, we all get our work done and um, you know for adjournment in, at the end of so. Some closing remarks, Representative Pugh? Um, no, these last two days have been very interesting and we will see you tomorrow for Dale. Very interesting sounds like when, <laughs> when you have a new a new piece of clothing and, and your husband tells you it, it's fine. I, I don't know how to take very interesting in. <laughs> My um, eighth grade English teacher said never use them. <laughs> never use what? Fine. fine. Yeah. It's a man. Um, and then, uh, thank go you ahead. Very much. And um, our committee will get together next week because I don't think, you know, um, really begin to figure out and committee members know what their areas of expertise in the budget are if they want to begin to pick those as well. Thank you very much. I think this has been a wonderful process. And again, thank you, um, Commissioner uh, Levine and your staff for an absolutely outstanding um, level-headed uh, response and leadership. Thank you. And I do want to apologize to those of you that are here. I've been extremely distracted. Um, I was getting my daughter out the door and then in the middle of this was the goodbye to drive to Michigan. And it's, it's, uh, it's a, not a, it's, a, it's an uneasy time for a mother, but then when your daughter's a little nervous too and the tears start spilling, it, it, be, it so that's why I've been very distracted and on and off the screen. But uh, I will, I think I'll be focused now, we'll see, until the phone calls start coming in. But thank you all, and uh, we're going to jump off our committee because we have to jump on with a fresh new screen for the healthcare. 
about mental health. Um, Going uh, off live now, Madam Chair. Please.